Good evening everybody and welcome to this meeting of the first of the municipal year of the local plan committee. I'm the new chair of the committee, Councillor Tim Young. The meeting is being live streamed and will be available to view after the meeting on the council's YouTube channel. To begin, there are a few matters of housekeeping, action in the event of an emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening, so if an alarm sounds, please evacuate the grand jury room by going back through the main entrance and down the stairs or via the staircase at the side of the building and then to the car park behind the town hall in St. Ronald Street. We may have a short break at 7.30 p.m. subject to the progress of business. And please would speakers use microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone and would participants please mute the microphones when they're not speaking. Right, I'm going to ask uh, the committee to introduce themselves, uh, each member and officers to be introduced go around the table, starting with the vice chair, please. Thank you. My name is Councillor Michelle Burrows uh, for Wivenhoe Ward, and I'm the deputy chair. Lee Scordis for Old Heath Five and Rowhedge. Uh, Mick Spindler for Shrub End. <coughs> Richard Kirkby Taylor representing Castle Ward. Lewis Barber representing Lexington and Brazier Ward. Good evening, Councillor Paul Dundas, Tiptree Ward. Laura Golding, Planning Policy Officer. Shelley Blackaby, Principal Planning Policy Officer. Sandra Scott, Pledge Strategy Manager. Karen Syrett, Head of Planning. Councillor Kayleigh Rippingale for Newtown and Christchurch. Robert Carmichael, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you, everybody. Um, substitutions, item two. We don't have any substitutions, but we have apologies from Councillor Paul Smith. We know Councillor Sunnox is in the environs of the, of the building, but he hasn't yet arrived. No doubt he will at some stage. Um, OK, we'll move on to item three, urgent items. No urgent items, Chair. Thank you, Rob. Uh, item four, declarations of interest. Do any councillors have any declar declarations of interest they wish to declare tonight? Looking around the table, there are none. Okay, move on to item five, minutes of the last meeting. Uh, can we approve the minutes of the meeting on the 3rd of April, please? Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Item six, got to have your say. We have two speakers on the list. I'll call them forward in the uh, order I've got them. I think they both know the procedure. Uh, Nick Chilvers, please. As you know, you've got three minutes, Nick. Bell will sell us sound after two. Thank you, Chairman. Now, I understand the city, Colchester city needs, uh, needs to have a master plan. Now, it might look impressive, but that doesn't mean it should all get a free pass. We mustn't lose sight of the detail and impact on uh, life opportunities. I rather thought the shape and mechanics of the consultation would roll out would come before this panel for more consideration. There was a long discussion last time, but none of the 10 members probed how the next stage would be conducted. Given the scope and ramifications of the uh, matter, I thought that seemed rather odd. And you know the word consultation itself generates negative uh, uh, reactions. So, so passing it for consultation was the easy bit. Surely you ought to ensure that all our diverse residents, businesses and areas are comfortable with it. And put yourself in their shoes. Everyone uses the centre or travels through it for one reason or another. There's a lot to digest. 92 pages plus 133 from highways. Now I wrote to the former uh, chair and the CEO about some of the planning jargon and technical terms. I didn't understand some of what they were talking about. Most of the public wouldn't and I doubt all the committee did. My query was at least followed up. The committee should have been all over that at the April meeting. It's, in fact, it should have been referred to the uh, campaign for plain English before going public. Think people, not just places. How will these plans affect residents and businesses? You need to keep it simple or people will switch off. 
Ask direct questions. For, for example, do you think four pedestrian crossings across Southway will improve air quality and congestion or not? When the two surface car parts are removed, will you switch to multi-storey or go somewhere else? Do you think businesses will prosper following the transport and car park charges? Is a cycle or bus a viable alternative for you to get your to your place of work, earn a living, access services or visit family? Will you be able to park conveniently to worship on a Sunday in the town centre or attend prayers at the mosque, newly extended mosque, on a Friday? That's just for starters. I could think of another dozen or so. I'm sure the committee could too. So how is the prep for the consultation going? Surely the committee would want to know and chip in if allowed. Perhaps it doesn't. I don't know. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, there is, a, of course, a, a procedure for the um, master plan document and the consultation. Uh, one of the officers, Karen, do you want to uh, explain to Mr Chilvers how that will work, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think this committee and the previous one that sat in the last meeting in the last financial year are aware that consultation is guided by the statement of community involvement. So that sets out minimum standards that the council will adhere to when it consults on the various levels of planning documents and indeed planning applications. So I don't think, you know, that document itself is subject to consultation and adoption, which is when um, that sort of thing is discussed. But I'd like to reassure you, Mr Chilvers, that the consultation on the city centre master plan will go far um, above and beyond the minimum statutory, statutory requirements. So there will be plenty of consultation. I'm all for plain English myself, so uh, we did see, the, see your comments and your email to the previous chair and the chief exec, and I think you were reassured that um, some additional information would be provided to ensure that people could understand. And the examples that you've given about crossings and car parks, they're exactly the issues that we want people to comment on, so I'm glad you've recognised that and um, are highlighting them here tonight and we'll obviously look forward to your involvement in due course. You have another minute Nick and I should assure you as Chair of the Local Plan Committee that we will be reviewing it regularly, the Master Plan document before it's finally uh, sent to the Council for approval. Uh, but you can come back for another minute. Thank you. Well, um, look, uh, there's more to life than the cafe, culture, heritage and art. And people have busy lives, juggling work, family commitments and cost pressures. And most people, working age people, aren't fretting about sitting around more in the town centre, chasing the towers, trying to get their heads above water. Um, they don't need more hassle, cost and frustration uh, in getting around. And I expect councillors to understand that. So um, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sarat's uh, assurances. Uh, I must admit, I would have liked to have heard some uh, uh, some comment or contribution from other members of the panel, but uh, that's up to them and you, the chair. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, I can reassure you, Mr. Chilvers, that this committee will keep uh, tabs on the progress of the consultation and um, debate it again fully in the future. And that's when the committee members will have the chance to have their say on it. Okay, our next have your say speaker is Sir Bob Russell, please. So Bob, you've got three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome to you and all the new members of the committee. Um, I don't expect any answers tonight. In fact, I prefer the answers to come in written form in due course. I believe in transparency in local government. I believe in democratic accountability and I believe in democratic decision making. So I'm going to talk about Holy Trinity Churchyard, not the building, the churchyard. My understanding is that the council owns the churchyard. What I'd like to know is who is actually running what is now out for consultation about the future of the churchyard? Was it democratically elected councillors who are driving this? Or is it officers? Or is it a quango? 
who's actually going to make the decisions on it. Your next agenda item is biodiversity supplementary planning document. I invite members of the committee to go across the library uh, when they're next available to look at the consultation there and see if they can find the words biodiversity mentioned at any point. So I'd like please to have a copy of the biodiversity statement, which has been prepared one assumes to go with the Holy Trinity Churchyard proposals. So I'd like to, to ha have that, but particularly I'd like to know who's actually driving this. Have councillors been involved at any stage? When was the decision made about the, the consultation proposals which are, are now there? I'd now like to follow up um, Mr Nick Chilver's comments on the master plan and to ask the bingo club in Osborne Street is the biggest attended leisure venue in the city centre. When did the council tell the operators of the bingo club their premises are required and that they'll have to move out? I now move up to St John Street multi-storey car park which the master plan indicates will have to be demolished at some point. When did Colster City Council mention this to Iceland and Wilkinson's two principal retail operators that their premises may have to go? Along Southway, when were the trustees of Colster Samaritans told that their headquarters will be required for redevelopment? When were the trustees of Bernard Brett House, which as you know, Chairman, um, houses people who are vulnerable, young people are vulnerable, when were they told that their premises are required for demolition and redevelopment? And when was the Salvation Army, when were they told that their citadel would be required for demolition? Have they been told? Have they been consulted? Thank you, Sir Bob. Um, Karen, I don't know if you know about Holy Trinity Churchyard, although Sir Bob did say he would prefer a written answer on that, but if you've got anything you can say about that, please do so. And then specific questions on the on the master plan please thank you oh sorry i'm too close i think the in terms of holy trinity churchyard i don't have the answers for that tonight so um i will refer that to others actually so you'll probably get a response from someone else rather than myself but i'll make sure that is passed on can you make sure that that is forwarded to sir bob and the rest of the committee yeah please. yes um, and then in terms of when were the bingo operator, Iceland, Wilkinson's, etc., told about their properties being required for redevelopment, stroke demolition, um, I don't think that is the case at the moment. Some proposals have been put forward in the master plan and they're, at the moment, they're subject to consultation. So there's nothing set in stone, but they're going to go forward for redevelopment at this stage and the council can't tell someone that um, they've got to move out unless they own the properties and I don't think any of those are owned with the exception of Iceland and Wilkinson's the council owns the building but there's a long lease on the ground floor of that building to thread needle I think from memory so it would be for them to decide if they wanted to change the lease or to discuss their lease or the subleases with the various operators or indeed the council. So I think it's a bit premature to be telling people that they've got to move out at this stage prior to the consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. You have another minute, Sir Bob? Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sire. I think that the courtesy would have been for people whose premises are threatened with demolition that they'd be told before it got into the public domain. And the only reason it's in the public domain because I know how to read council reports. And apart from the bingo club being mentioned by name, the others, I've had to just look at the maps and put two and two together. And I just think that it was out of courtesy before it got in the public domain the people who occupy those buildings, Colts of Samaritans, Salvation Army, the Bingo Club, and so on, I think they, out of courtesy, it would have been nice if they'd been approached and told by the council, this is what's going to be in the master plan, just to let them know. Thank you. Thank you. So we're of course at liberty to respond to the consultation, but I take your point. 
Thank you very much. Okay, that's all the have you say speakers. So we will move on to item seven, which is the main item of uh, business tonight, which is the biodiversity supplementary planning document. We haven't got any have your say speakers or visiting councillors to address the committee on this item. So I'll invite Shelley to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. In February this year, a draft biodiversity supplementary planning document or SPD was presented to the local plan committee and approval was given to consult on the draft SPD in accordance with the town and country planning regulations and Colchester's statement of community involvement. Public consultation took place from the 22nd of February to 22nd of March and nine organisations responded to the consultation. Their comments have been taken into account and the draft biodiversity SPD has been amended. A schedule of the comments made and how they've been taken into account and the amended biodiversity SPD are both appended to this report. The committee is asked to adopt the biodiversity SPD. To provide some context, the planning policy team are preparing three SPDs to address the climate emergency. This biodiversity SPD, an active travel SPD and a climate change SPD. The active travel and climate change SPD will be presented to a future local plan committee meeting. SPDs build upon and provide more detailed advice or guidance on policies in an adopted local plan. As they do not form part of the development plan, they cannot introduce new policies or amend adopted planning policies. SPDs are a material planning consideration in decision making. The most relevant local plan policy to this SPD is policy ENB1, Environment. This is a lengthy policy with different sections and the most relevant part to this SPD is Part C, Biodiversity and Geodiversity, and the report sets out this part of Policy EMB1. The policy includes criteria related to the principal objective of conserving, protecting and enhancing biodiversity. The policy refers to the mitigation hierarchy and requires 10% biodiversity net gain ahead of when this becomes mandatory nationally. Biodiversity is an important consideration in plan making and decision making. The Biodiversity SPD aims to clearly set out the protection that should be afforded to biodiversity features and the principles the Council expects to ensure that development proposals enhance biodiversity by creating space for nature. This SPD is intended to be concise and it includes references and links to numerous other documents. Officers are working with officers from other Essex councils and Essex County Council to draft a biodiversity net gain template SPD. Chapter one of the biodiversity SPD introduces the climate emergency and the SPD. Chapter two sets out the background and context. Chapter three sets out the con Colchester context and it includes maps of Colchester's environmental designations and a link to interactive nature on the map. Chapter four includes advice on ecological surveys and protected species surveys as a check of what information is likely to be required in support of an application. Chapter five explains the mitigation hierarchy. Chapter six includes creating space for nature design principles. These are principles that applicants will be expected to incorporate into their proposals to enhance biodiversity. Chapter seven includes a list of examples of ways that household applications can enhance biodiversity. And chapter eight lists planning application expectations, what the council will expect applicants to submit with an application. Nine respondents commented on the draft SPD as part of the public consultation. The comments made were helpful and the SPD has been amended. The key amendments made to the SPD include additions to Chapter 4 to include reference to other ecological surveys that may be required rather than just protected species surveys. And there's reference in this chapter to the Essex Biodiversity Validation Checklist. Reference is made to a list of locally significant species that will be prepared by Colchester Natural History Society and published on the Council's website alongside 
at this SPD. Further text has been added to the SPD about the mitigation hierarchy and irreplaceable habitats. More information has been added to some of the design principles, including widening the avoiding artificial grass principle, include reference to flowering lawns. A requirement has been added for a construction environment management plan and additions have been made to the further reading and references section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley, for that presentation. Uh, I have to say I thought it was an excellent report. Someone who hasn't been involved in the development of this, I uh, found it a great read and obviously we're putting the planet first in uh, everything we do and um, this is a part of that. So thank you very much. And thank you to the nine respondents uh, who um, responded and their representations are in the agenda. Okay, over to the committee to uh, clarification, ask questions or comments. Councillor Sunnox, thank you for joining us. And uh, please ask your question or make your comment. Apologies for being a minute late. I saw you in the car park. You're obviously on an important call. <laughs> um, I've got two, two points here. The first is, um, I was really hoping this document would be laying out the um, uh, some rules for off-site provision in more detail, and that we'd see some sort of market appearing in the area, whereby uh, sites where they can't do their 10% BNG gain on, the, on, on site, uh, 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 make arrangements with other sites. And, and I, I, so my question is, do we actually want to encourage that? Do we want to see a market there? I feel it would be helpful if we did. I think we could make some uh, a bigger progress in total by doing it. Do we want to try and put everything on site? And what do we do where it's just not possible to do that? Do we just fudge the figures? And we've seen, we've seen some examples of that. Or, or you know, how do we handle it? Can we answer, look at that one first? Because I've got one other point as well. Shelley, do you want to come back on that one, please? Yes, yeah, so biodiversity net gain. Um, so this SPD doesn't include a section on biodiversity net gain. Um, and the reason for that was to focus on protection and enhancement. But also, there's still a lot of guidance and secondary legislation to come on biodiversity net gain. Um, as I mentioned and, and said in the report, the officers are working with some officers from other Essex councils on a template biodiversity net gain SPD. I think all planners in Essex recognise there's a lot to do to get ready for mandatory biodiversity net gain on major sites, which will come into force in November. There's a lot to do to get ready for that. We've made progress on the template SPD. But there's only so far it can go without further guidance and legislation. So it's sort of got to as far as it can really until that comes out. But in terms of a, a market for offsite, I think that yes, a, a market for offsite BNG will need to come. I think my opinion is there's a, a case for on site and off site biodiversity net gain. So we'll need another we'll need another one of these documents in a in a year's time on biodiversity net gain, which is different from the biodiversity SPD. That leads into my second point: is from the developer's point of view, there are so many of these documents and plans and SPDs, and the list goes on and on and on, and they're all lengthy documents. I've been engaged with um, uh, working with Karen to try and um, uh, get some clarity into one, one of these documents uh, from Essex County Council. And I think we really have to just think what this adds to the existence. We've got the NV1, we've probably got stuff in the MPPF, there's stuff all over the place. And it's sort of, from the developer's point of view, it just really adds to the cost of doing business uh, to have to deal with such, so many um, documents and such long ones. This one's 41 pages. You know, isn't the way, there are some things that we've added. There's evidently a list of local species and one or two other things you mentioned. Could we not find a briefer, more succinct way of putting it? Yeah, the intention was to make this as concise as possible. Um, there are there are so many documents. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have made it a little bit shorter, but it's a it's a big topic, and this is all focused on protection and enhancement. And in terms of 
adding to burden. SPDs can't add to burden. Um, they are there to provide further guidance rather than further requirements. They've got to be read. Thank Thanks you, them. yes. And I'm sure developers have got the resources to read 41 pages, Councillor Sonnex. Councillor Dundas, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Lots of interesting information in there. Um, just a couple of uh, comments or questions. Um, firstly, regarding the maps, which, which are interesting, actually. Um, could perhaps do with slightly higher resolution ones, because it's actually quite difficult to work out where some of the boundaries are. But on, on the local wildlife sites map, um, I just wonder if perhaps you could expand a bit on the material planning consideration this will actually give, because I can actually see, I think, one or two areas uh, which are designated local wildlife sites, which I think have actually been subject to planning applications uh, not that long ago, if I read the map correctly. So perhaps if you, I realise it's slightly a subjective answer, because it depends on all sorts of things, but I wonder if I, you could perhaps uh, let us know exactly how much weight or, or, or uh, armoury um, um, this actually gives. And, and secondly, talking about planning applications, now I appreciate the, all of this most of the time applies to major planning applications. But on where we list the expectations for planning applications, I just want to uh, be reassured that we've got some safeguards in place that we don't end up putting a, an unrealistic or unnecessary cost, cost burden on people putting in very, very minor applications to which perhaps some of this isn't at all, all relevant. You know, I can think of somebody moving a fence or something, well, if there's no hedge there or something, um, and they have to go and get independent reports in, you know, are we putting a lot of cost on people for putting in a simple planning application that we're just being sure we're not doing that? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Shelley? Um, so with the maps, there was a discussion actually about maps when the draft SPD came to the committee in February. Um, and I think Council has made a similar point about the quality of the maps and reference was added to DEFRA's nature on the map. So if anyone's looking at this online, if anything's not clear, especially those lo local wildlife sites, there are a lot of those throughout the city. People can check those on nature on the map and zoom in and, and be able to check boundaries. Um, so in terms of local wildlife site, yes, local wildlife sites are sites that are important for nature conservation they're part they're an important part of the local network and we so if a planning application is put in that's likely to affect a local wildlife site that would be something that the case officer planning committee would consider biodiversity is an important consideration it's one of many considerations when assessing planning applications and just the, the comment about expectations i've just had a look at chapter eight the planning application expectations um, a lot of these apply to major applications so there's not a, a burden on small applications i i mentioned there's a section in here on householder applications and that's not to put a burden on anyone carrying out a small piece of work it's more the, the householder applications chapter is a list of relatively simple things that people could do as a sort of encouragement rather than a requirement. Thank, Thank you, so. that reassures me. Thank, Thank you. Councilor Barber. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Shelley, for the report. So I think we're a bit close there as well. Um, what, firstly, uh, sort of a compromise, I suppose, the fact that looking through the respondents' uh, comments in the uh, original proposal, the extent to which we've taken on board valid uh, input and amended the document accordingly. I think with anybody's line of work, it always is a, a strength to actually acknowledge where maybe something needs to be changed or, or improved. And I can only commend the where we've done that and also where we've pushed back a bit on where actually we do disagree and we provide a robust reason for it. Uh, I, drawing on the comments within this report, I was interested to see Chris Nicholson respond to every single part of it. Um, is there any particular reason Chris Nicholson are doing that? Because I'm not aware of them being active developers on any ongoing sites or upcoming sites. Um, is Are they sort of going through everyone's similar uh, policy documents across the country and as seeking to test them in such a way. I was just wondering why they, if we know, uh, because there's no reason for us to know, but if there's any reason we know they, because as far as I'm aware, they're 
HQ nowhere near us and their nearest development site currently is in Ipswich. I know they have built in Colchester, but I'm just wondering, intrigued really more than anything on that front. I'm Good not question. sure. Um, I don't know. Sandra or Karen. Um, yeah. Karen, any inside info on Chris Nicholson? No, no. I think Tiptree, did they build? Tiptree was the latest one, Factory yeah. Hill, um, which is completed pretty much by some works. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, they, they were very interested in something at Mark's table. Elsa Sonnex, if you could speak through the chair, it would be much appreciated. Elsa's going to descend into games. I, I was going to say, they did have an option on some land in Mark's Day, but I've not heard anything from them on that since um, the Section 1 examination, which they appeared at. So um, they made their interest known at that stage, but they haven't followed up. So, yeah, it must, must be just maybe part of their policy to um, respond to these sort of consultations. Uh, anybody else before I bring Councillor Sonnex back in? I've got Councillor Scordis and then Councillor Kirkby Taylor. Lee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think what we've done here is we've addressed a lot of the issues that do come up in Colchester when house building is mentioned, and biodiversity is one of those those issues that does come up, uh, building over green spaces, so forth. So I feel that we as a council have taken that on board, um, and we've given ourselves a, a bit more of a, a buffer against some developers who may try and go a bit rogue. So. I think this is really good. As Councillor Barber said, we've added amendments in and suggestions from other people, including councillors, which is really helpful. Um, so for me, really good piece of work, the way to go forward and will hopefully um, set us in the right direction on our climate emergency aims. Thanks, Lee. I don't think there's any need to respond, but yeah, we, I, I totally agree with the points Councillor Scott has just made. Uh, Richard. Sorry, yes, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you for taking on board um, so many of the comments, uh, particularly my concerns about things like definitions of irreplaceable habitats um, and the at-risk species and bringing it into referencing the locally applicable information rather than just the nationally applicable stuff. Um, I think <clears throat> the local information on that is, is very important. Um, so th thank you for including that. The maps, um, you're absolutely right. We, we did ask for them to be included, the links to be included as well. Um, and it's nice to see the link for the DEFRA site on the first page of chapter three. Uh, the mitigation hierarchy, um, it's nice to have the additional clarification that compensation measures are a last resort. Um, and the reminder about 30 year compensation measures needing to be in place before anything else begins. That, that, that's all really good stuff. Really like that those have now actually been um, uh, introduced and included. The further reading section, I know that space is limited. Um, <clears throat> you've put in loads of, of really useful resources. I might have liked to see some kind of references to some of the new regenerative um, schemes and developments and, and um, frameworks that are being developed at the moment. Um, but these are I completely accept these are um, kind of emerging fields. So they are areas that are going to be changing very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, it, it might be nice if, if there was a reference in there somewhere. But again, I, as I say, I recognise they are emerging fields and it's going to be changing very, very rapidly. Um, Thank you, Richard. Shelley, do you want to respond to that, that last point? Yeah. It it could be. I'm just thinking this the biodiversity net gain template SPD that Essex councils are working on. Um, at some point, this council may choose to adopt that, so that would be added to our website. Um, it could be a good time to look at updating the list of further references, even if that's references and other documents and case studies could even be added as a standalone document, something that we could keep up to date. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, aware that Reba are doing some uh, some very good work on um, on regenerative um, technologies as well. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, Councillor Sonnex, by all means, come back in. Yes, um, I want to come back uh, with respect, Mr. Chairman, on your remark about developers having the resource to read an extra forty-one pages, and I'd like it minuted. I think this is a this is a different. 
this is a different, um, um, uh, a, a real a difference in attitude uh, towards what developers can do and how they should be treated. Uh, their costs in complying with all these planning rules are, are through the roof. And I just like that, I just hope that can be minuted. Uh, sure, it can. Uh, just to let you know that Councillor Spindler's had the family emergency, has had to leave the meeting very, very quickly. But yeah. Thank you for that. Anybody else wish to make a comment? Okay, then uh, we will move uh, to the vote. Um, can I see those in favour? The committee approves adopting the biodiversity supplementary planning document. All those in favour? <clears throat> That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelley, for that excellent report. Very good. Uh, we'll move on to item eight, the neighbourhood planning update. Again, no have you say speakers or visiting councillors. So Laura, if you could present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Neighbourhood plans were first introduced through the Localism, Localism Act 2011 and allow parish or town councils and designated groups of local people to prepare plans for their community. The National Planning Policy Framework and changes to the planning practice guidance continue to demonstrate the importance of neighbourhood planning and it has remained high on the national government's agenda since regulations were introduced. This report provides an update on the status of the adopted and emerging neighbourhood plans across Colchester. We also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the improvements we've made to the Council's neighbourhood plan web pages, making it much more user friendly. We've also produced an updated guidance document which has been prepared to help parish and town councils consider whether a neighbourhood plan is right for them and how to prepare, prepare review and update a neighbourhood plan. Currently eight neighbourhood plans have been made in Colchester. These include Wivenhoe, Boxted, Myland and Braswick, West Burgholt, Eight Ash Green, Mark's Tay, West Mersey and most recently Tiptree which was made in May this year after a successful referendum. Great Tay and Great Hawksey are the evidence gathering and plan preparation stage. It is anticipated that Cockford and Eastthorpe neighbourhood plan will be made later this year following the examiner's report being issued in May this year. Recommending subject to modification, the plan can proceed to referendum. The Marlinda Braswick review commenced in 2021 and recently was subject to consultation. This is the first neighbourhood plan to undertake a review in Culture City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, any comments or questions from, uh, from uh, yes, Councillor Sonnex and then Councillor Barber? Yes, um, I think it's, it's really good the way the neighbourhood plans are coming along. Um, but what we have to do is we have to accept if we're going to put more power into neighbourhood planning committees, we have to respect them. And there's a case in my ward where there's a strong feeling that hasn't been done. So I think even if the expertise isn't as strong at neighbourhood level, you know, we have to sort of, we have to try and uh, respect what local people want, even if it's not quite in line with what officers would want. Laura, do you want to come back? Or oh. oh, Karen, Karen, yes, I thought. Karen, please, please respond. It would be useful to know the example. I'll give it to you afterwards, Karen. Thank you. Because the neighbourhood plans once made are part of the development plan, like the local plan. Right. I think that might be better yeah. if people can hear me. Yeah, so they carry as much weight in the decision making as an adopted local plan policy. There will be instances where departures are made or where a proposal um, has to be balanced against a number of considerations, but you know, in general, then we do have a strong regard to neighbourhood plan policies. Thank you, Karen. I'm sure if um, officers are any claims that they're being obstructive, then Karen would want to know about them. So, if you talk to uh, Karen afterwards, William, then I'm sure that not would remotely to... obstructive. Just to clarify, I will talk to you about it afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Barber, Lewis. Sorry, thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I, I'm guessing the example uh, Councillor Sunnix is referring to is in Great Tay, uh, but I expect the answer there will probably be it's not yet adopted, which is the challenge um, with the neighbour plan. Um, but I'll leave you to liaise on uh, the specifics on that. 
I just want to ask, what would you say is the main learning process for groups that are involved in making a neighbourhood plan? What would you say has been the biggest biggest thing from a council perspective uh, that we've learned, and also from those may or interested in starting a neighbourhood plan? So, for instance, Chapel and Wakescombe tried to get off the ground, had one meeting, nobody came along and abandoned. Now, is it that we've learned lessons from other groups that that's not the best way to do it? It might be, I don't know, if, if there's quite clear lessons we've learned, even information sheets sent to uh, CALC or EALC and um, with what we, we've learned throughout the process, really. And particularly now, Marlene and Braiswick's up for review too, what, what we're doing different, I suppose. Thanks, good question. Who wants to answer that? Sandra? Yeah. Okay, Sandra first. Yeah, okay. How long have you got? I think I'd say. Um, well, we're running a pretty <laughs> short meeting so far, Sandra. So. <laughs> um, it's a good point. There are a lot of lessons I think we can learn along the way. And I think um, because in Colchester, the support for neighbourhood plan groups is through officers, I think we do try to um, sort of uh, feed that in as groups um, come forward and want to um are thinking about or you know wondering whether that's the right thing for them to do um i certainly think we've come a long way through learning experience since the first um sort of we were well, had two front runners in the first lot of neighborhood plans when the legislation first came, came in but i guess if the the key headlines are probably being um being clear about what the scope is that they what it is they want to achieve to help them understand whether or not um, it is actually the right vehicle to achieve what they are seeking to influence um, and uh, getting enough of the right a mix of interested um, residents and community representatives on board um, from the outset so that um, because I think probably any neighbourhood plan group would probably tell you that you know, they didn't realise how much hard work it is, how long it was going to take um, and the challenges and just how difficult it is and I think those that have been I would say really brave and taken on board oh, there's a fly that won't leave me alone, <laughs> taken on board allocating sites is probably um, an even bigger challenge for them and um, you know I think there's a lot of lessons but talking of chapel I did attend a meeting a couple of years ago now to talk to them about the you know ifs buts and maybes to help them think about whether that was the right thing to do it was a very well attended meeting and probably one of the best useful contributions that they had there is they invited representatives from Atash Green to come and talk firsthand from their experience, who were, I have to say, was a very positive, their view of doing an April plan was very positive, um, is a sense that I get. Yeah. Um, but I think that was <coughs> invaluable, and I would certainly urge any groups who are thinking about it to, to us, we can help bring other groups along to talk yeah. to, because I think that's, they can offer probably far more useful insight than we can as officers. Sorry, that does in a nutshell. Does anybody <laughs> want to add to what Sandra said, Karen? Only a slightly different take because I probably, my experience is similar lessons learned to what Sandra's outlined. But I think it's a good question. I almost wonder whether it's worth us surveying those people that, well, all parish councils really, those that have undertaken um, the process and what the benefits have been, what the pitfalls have been from their point of view, and those that have decided not to, and why they've made that decision. I think that might be quite an interesting yeah. exercise. I think it would, and maybe go to in non-parished areas, community associations or yeah. residence groups, or ward councillors, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Michelle, Councillor Burrows. Thank you. I think that's a really good idea, actually, especially to get the opinions of people from wards whose neighbourhood plans have had made a really big difference. So, for example, Wivenhoe, where we've had the opportunity to turn down two planning applications for a particular development, 
So going back to what you were saying, Sandra, how much work it is, it kind of demonstrates, doesn't it, that actually the work is really, really worthwhile. Thank you. Councillor Scordis. Yeah, I mean, this kind of comes neatly into my point. I mean, neighbourhood plans seem to work really well, um, but clearly the weakness we have is that they're only active in areas where we have a, a town, parish or community council, where you have people who want to put those hours in and are more than happy to and devoted to the area. But areas that are non-parished, um, like my ward, Newtown, Shrub End, Beer Church, they've all got a lot of green well green still hasn't got as much because i was going to say brownfield site um so old heath you've got whitehall estate you've got all of the hive which is in the local plan you've got paxman's as well um now not that much people have kicked up a fuss and want to get involved um but they feel a weakness there that local people don't have the chance to map that area, what it will look like in the future, unlike the villages, which are having that opportunity. Similar to Beer Church, you've got the old army land, that's a lot, of, a lot of that is being converted into housing and some of it's not very well designed, but that was done many years ago. Um, I think really that's our, that's our one weakness. And I guess it's thinking about how we do get around that, whether <coughs> you would form a residence association of people who are really interested and want to keep the character of their community and so forth um, and work with the council. Um, and I can understand why there'd be disagreements because I've been in local politics enough to be on the same side of people who disagree with you and it all kicks off long enough in the Labour Party of doing that as well. So um, I can understand why Great Tay might be a bit of a problem as well. Not everyone always agrees. But um, yeah, for me, I'd like to look in the future about how we can get those non-parish communities working together because well, we've seen it with Middlewick and so forth where you do have a lot of angry people coming here and not really getting involved in the process and for me there's an opportunity in areas like that and other parts of Colchester where we can get those type of people involved and get a good solution for everyone. I'll have to take you around Greenstead Road and Hawkins Road to show you some brownfield sites in Greenstead Ward Council School this. Uh, does someone want to come back on that? Sandra or Laura? Mm -hmm. Laura? Yeah. <laughs> um, so when it's not a parish area a, a neighbourhood forum would need to be formed um, so that can be, um, well, there are obviously requirements in forming a neighbor forum, which is in the guidance um, uh, document. Um, one of them is a minimum of 21 members that live or work in the area. Um, so, yeah, and there's, there's other um, stipulations, um, but yeah, that's how it's done through a forum rather than um, through the parish. Thanks, that's useful information. Sandra? Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I, I think it would be brilliant if there was um, a, a unparished, um, a, you know, cent covering all those areas where all those issues are a neighbourhood plan to, to come forward. But I think the key thing is it needs to come from the, the, the initiative needs to come from the community and, um, and you know, so work and um, having groups that engage positively to to address some of the challenges that you know um some of the sites that that and some of the issues that we're grappling with you know um in many of those areas would be you know a really positive way to take things forward but i think it's it's really difficult without those people coming from you know it the whole idea of neighbor planning is bottom up bottom up rather than the the council saying, you know, to, to do it, it's got to come from them. And we would welcome it with our open arms if there was such a group that would, would you know, positively want to engage um, and, and go down that route, so. Thank you, Sandra. Councillor Dundas. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just to comment on this, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced, um, I've dealt with Stanway Parish Council, which didn't succeed with the neighbourhood uh, plan and Tipton, which did. And, and it really comes down to individuals and pure luck as to whether you can find one or two people who are prepared to put in what can be thousands of hours of unpaid work, who, are, who either have or are prepared to go out there and gain the skills. Because at the end of the day, somebody has got to prepare a document uh, which has got to pass a planning inspector. 
Well, that is something which is normally done by professional planners such as yourselves. Now, I appreciate that you haven't got, we haven't got the resources to go and do that for them. So for a parish council, they've either got to be lucky and have somebody who's prepared to work unpaid for an enormous amount of time and have the skills, somebody who is prepared to go and learn the skills of a professional planning uh, uh, person, or they've got to pay for it uh, third party, which uh, parish councils simply haven't got the money to do that. So it, it's pure luck of just finding those one or two people and they are rare commodities. Um, we talk about volunteering and community groups, but. Uh, you know, you, you generally have to find somebody who's retired, who isn't working full time, because it's virtually impossible to do working full time, mm -hmm. and, and who has those skills. And, and it, it's just down to luck as to whether there's somebody in a given area. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, good point. Councillor Bob. Thank you. Just uh, just to support really the comments about the, the non parished areas and if we could do any communications around that or any, anything we as war councillors could share with residents, particularly, I know, not just relying on resident groups, but they are obviously quite useful in non parished areas, resident associations, that would be very helpful. And I guess just to note, say all the feedback from the areas uh, that I represent that have parish, uh, parish council, neighbour plans, is how positive they've been about the work uh, you guys have done at an officer level engaging with them. They've nothing but positive things to say about the extent to which you've gone to support them throughout the process. And um, so I just suppose a thank you from myself as well for helping them through that process. Um, but one, one point I did want to stress is that I've had a couple areas say they're not going to go through it because they have no sort of medium sized development sites in their area. And I think that's a mistake them viewing neighbour plans as just a vehicle to deliver developments of say 150 to 200 homes because there's obviously a lot of other policies that go into it and when we interact with be it parish areas or non-parish areas on this going forward it might be worth trying to emphasise that point a bit more that it's not just policies on development sites there's a lot more that goes with it as well because there seems to be some confusion that you need development to have a neighbour plan and I think that's a missed opportunity really. So. That was all I wanted to say. Thanks, Jeff. Can we take that on board, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Any other points? No, that report was just for information. So we'll uh, note that and move on to item nine, which is cost of local plan update and future work. Again, no speakers from the public or councillors visiting. So, Sandra, present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this reports for members' information and provides a brief overview about the local plan, setting the context for where we are currently and future work. Even for those members of this local plan committee who have previously been involved in various stages of plan preparation and adoption, this re report provides a useful reminder and an introduction to those members who are new to the local plan committee. It's a statutory requirement for a local planning authority to have a local plan under the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act. Local plans are a key component of the planning system and provide a framework for guiding decisions on the individual planning applications. Colchester has always maintained an up-to-date local plan, which currently comprises of sections one and two of the Colchester local plan, the Tipsy Dram, Dram Factory DPD, sorry, development plan document, and a number of neighbourhood plans, which we've just um, been reminded of. Um, additional plans can be prepared. Um, for example, the tendering Colchester Borders Garden Community Development Plan document, which is a requirement of the Section 1 um, Colchester Local Plan. It's currently being prepared jointly with tendering District Council, overseen by the Joint Committee and I'm sure you're all aware is currently out for consultation. Supplementary planning documents such as the biodiversity um, SPD adopted earlier this evening um, can also be prepared with the intention of providing further detailed guidance expanding on policies in the, um, the, uh, the main local plans. The full list of these that are currently adopted are, are um, provided in the local plan background which is attached to this report. It's important that local plan is kept up to date and it has um, uh, potential implications for planning decisions if policies are considered to be out of date. And there's a statutory requirement for the local plan to be reviewed every five years. 
um, which in the case of Colchester means a new local plan will be required by February 2026 because that's based on the, the adoption date of Section 1 local plan. There are a number of considerations which apply when identifying um, policies within a plan that need to be updated, um, which essentially requires up-to-date proportionate evidence to support, support those updates or to justify where a review is not required. Preparing an up-to-date plan, local plan, um, as many of you will be only too aware, is a significant undertaking and the lead-in time commences with the updating and gathering of evidence. Early work on some key areas of evidence has already commenced for the um, review of the um, looking at the review for the local plan, um, such as important updates on environmental evidence, including green infrastructure, open spaces, and waterways. This will include engagement with stakeholders and local communities, including town and parish councils, to provide an important local perspective on this evidence. Further reports to future local plan committees will include the full scope and estimated time scale of the evidence-based work that's um, considered to be required, the consideration of the approach on key matters including the scope and methodology for a strategic land availability assessment and call for sites, and uh, plan preparation details including more information of the timeline and the approach to engagement and the initial issues and options, which as the first stage of plan making. So that's all to come, um, but um, thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Yes, as someone who's taken a healthy interest in the local planning committee and who used to have it in uh, my portfolio several years ago, it was uh, very helpful to receive this report. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Councillor Dundas and then Councillor Sy. Uh, th thank you, and th thank you for the report. It's got these just seem to come around very quickly, don't they? <laughs> just when you think you're, you're finished. I mean, I suppose, and it's very early days um, at the moment, you know, uh, how, how much revision is going to happen obviously depends on how the existing plan has performed against expectations, um, particularly around, I suppose, the five-year um, housing supply. So um, I just wonder if perhaps you could, and I re realise you can't take account of external factors like changes in government policy and that, but assuming everything else remains the same, in terms of a new call for sites, um, what sort of scale do we think we might be looking at? Are we looking for hundreds of more or thousands of more or no more? You know, I can think of a few sites which should have come forward by now, which are running a bit behind uh, Mill Road. Um, Five Ways Fruit Farm, I think, is, is, is running a bit behind where we thought it would be. Um, I don't know where Middlewick is. I don't know whether the a condition, I assume it will be a conditional sale of land has actually occurred yet or when we expect that to happen and we might actually see some planning applications on that. So really just, just to sort of, you know, forewarned is uh, uh, whatever, just to give us an idea of where we're heading, what's the scale of revisions do you think at the moment we might be thinking about or looking at? Thank you, Paul. Sandra? Okay, well, um, in terms of um, looking at numbers, um, based on what we know at the moment, and Karen might be better to, to add to this, but um, we know that the next local plan under the, the current um, framework and so on will require us to apply the standard methodology. And um, we know that that, that um, at the point when we sort of looked at the, the, what those figures are, that that, that gives us the higher figure than we're on an annual basis than we have at the moment. Um, obviously, that may change, but um, but at the moment, that's that's what what we know. Um, so, I think that's probably in terms of um, performance against you know sites that are in the current plan. Um, uh, all of those factors on you know sites that are coming forward um, through annual monitoring, five year supply, and um, the, um, the sort of where sites are um, in that are currently in the local plan will all factor into what what pulls out the other end, if you like, of the the, the figure that we're um, we're aiming for. Um, it's more Karen's field, so um, I don't know if she's got anything to add. But Karen, um, yeah, I think we'll do the call for sites, Paul, and. In that process, we'll need to review all those sites that are included in 
recently as allocations to ascertain whether they still remain deliverable and developable in accordance with national um, planning framework. So all of the ones that you mentioned, I suspect some of those will have already commenced by the time we um, undertake the call for sites and then the strategic housing land assessment to assess them all. But they will, you know, some of them will carry forward. We won't lose those numbers. They'll certainly project forward. And you might say, well, if you've not delivered them so far, then it helps with those remaining years because it's a constantly rolling target that we're seeking to um, attain. I think that probably answers the question. Did you say a number, Sandra? Yeah. Oh. Not precise, I couldn't remember exactly what it was. So no. it was <laughs> I think the last figure was about 1,100 a year. It does change when different affordability ratios come out, which we have to put into the equation. But that's at the moment what we're looking at. Does it done this? You want to come back? Just very, I appreciate. I wasn't asking for an exact number. I appreciate the difficulty around it, and and I'm not committing you to any particular thing. I suppose my final question is regarding the existing plan. Are there any? major sites in there at the moment you are particularly concerned around in terms of deliverable or whether they're, they're going to be delivered at all? The final policy for Middlewick set a very high bar. Um, for that site to be developed, then there's an awful lot of policy criteria that needs to be met. And there will need to be more evidence to um, support that site going forward. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Paul, Thank you for the question. Uh, William, Councillor Sonnex. Yes, I thought that it was going to be a sort of nice year off this year. We're going to fiddle around with a few minor DPDs and things like that. And, uh, and there we are. We got to have adopted it by 2026, and they're going to look at the housing numbers again. What do we have to do to keep those housing numbers, that 920 that we're on at the moment? I thought that lasted us for 15 years or something like that. It was a 15 year plan. And suddenly here we are having to start it all over again. And if it's 2026, we've got to sort of like start yesterday. It took us, I, you started the last one in 2015 or something, and it was adopted in about 2021. Um, uh, so um, uh, yes, I'm really, I, I was really quite surprised when I read that very short and wonderfully short paper. What a wonderful, shining example of a, of a, of a good paper. Karen? Do you want to, uh, is that, is Gal Sonnex right about the timescale and the numbers and all the revisions that we might have to do? Uh, yes and no, really. It's, yeah, we are charged with preparing a plan that for 15 years minimum. Um, but then we have to review that plan every five years. And we could, re and it's within five years, we could review the plan and decide nothing needs updating. And then it could carry on for another five years and we review it at that stage. So in theory, it could last 15 years, but anyone that's sat on this committee or been a councillor for more than a few months knows that planning does not sit still. And we're faced with constant changes at a national level, which then impact on our own adopted local plan. And that's the same with the standard methodology for calculating housing numbers. The government have published consultations on changes to that and how that might be implemented. But as of yet, nothing firmer than consultation has come to light. So, you know, we could get a little bit more time, but not a lot more time, I would say. I like to think the last local plan was an exception. <laughs> they should take that long. Previous ones haven't, in Colchester anyway. But they are taking that long and longer elsewhere in the country these days as well. So it wasn't just North East Essex. There's also factors to consider, you know, about joint working um, and whether there's an appetite for that going forward, which will be something that this committee will um, want to discuss at some point in the not too distant future. So lots of things to consider really. 
Yes, we're going to be kept busy. Councillor Sonnex, final word? Is there a, is there a way of um, reviewing the plan or mechanism for reviewing the plans so that we don't upset those numbers and have to go through the whole process again? Um, just feel that this is, you know, we're launching into such a big task again so quickly and we just go around in circles. But the, there must be a few words. We, do, do we have to leave the plan absolutely every word the same for it not to go through the whole process? The trouble is, what's forcing the review more than anything, or forcing us to do something, is the fact that the standard methodology has been in place for quite some time. Had we not have submitted the local plan before, well, we submitted in 2017, because we did, and it took so long, we've benefited from that lower number for a number of years. The standard methodology was introduced, I can't remember, 2019, possibly 2020. Um, so that in itself means that we do have to review the housing numbers. And you start reviewing the housing numbers and then you need to look at housing sites and then you need to look at employment sites to support the new residents and then you want community infrastructure. So you're looking at the whole plan. We're going to be kept busy. Councillor Barber. Thanks, Chair. Just on the note about the standard methodology um, and uh, before the comments end up on a leaflet somewhere, I'm not suggesting that we do this, but I saw um, I saw a number of authorities in response to the government's announcement that the formula was just or the numbers was just going to be guidance rather than obligatory remove their plan or withdrew it and i know that was i don't think they were adopted that was just during the examination process i think um, but have we had any test cases elsewhere in the country where developers have gone up against uh, the the government's changing view on this to actually test whether that's legally up upheld and actually the numbers are really only guidance um, rather than actually a fixed target to hit or is it too early to say uh, really similar to like when the prime minister announced no more building on greenfield didn't actually wasn't backed up with legislation so actually they can say what they want and it might give an indication in court but really the, the position hasn't legally changed it'd be just useful to know that though tempted to say which prime minister but i won't um karen the um yeah it it is a a tricky one because those authorities that have withdrawn plans you're right they're not at an adopted stage some of them haven't even been submitted for examination yet i would say they are subject to speculative development proposals as a result if they haven't got an up-to-date adopted plan so they run that risk now, they might prefer that risk to actually making the decisions themselves. And we've seen that, haven't we, elsewhere, where councils haven't wanted to take some difficult decisions because they can always blame it on the planning inspector if an appeal is allowed. I don't think that's what we would want in Colchester. I think we would prefer it to be plan-led, even if we've got to um, take those difficult decisions and allocate sites where they're not always popular. At the moment, because it is only guidance or consultation, we can't take that into account. So I've not seen any appeal decisions where um, authorities have said we're going to withdraw because we're going to come in with um, a lower number. Now the government has said um, it's just a guideline. I mean, at the same time, they haven't moved away from saying we need to build 300,000 new homes every year and they've got to go somewhere. Thank you. That's really helpful. So, yes, we're going to have a, not have a light year by the sounds of things. So, so um, but thank you for your contributions tonight. They've been very useful. I think it's been a good meeting. Thank you to the officers. Uh, no other business. So I declare the meeting closed. Thank you for your attendance and have a safe journey home.